you for the high calling it is to be a woman. And I thank you for our specific roles. And I pray, Lord, that if there's any in the audience or any that are listening that have hardened hearts towards your word, especially in this area, that you would open their eyes to see truth, that you would soften their hard hearts, that you would help them to see that the role that we have in the church is a good role because it's been ordained by God and that it's what he has called us to do and it is a privilege. <clears throat> so Father, give grace, I pray, for teaching and for listening and for obeying what we know to be true because it is your word. And I thank you in Christ's name. Well, when I was growing up in a Baptist minister's home, there was a popular book called Bobbed Hair, Bossy Wives, and Women Preachers. And uh, <clears throat> I remember that book sitting in the foyer of my dad's church. And the title was certainly a catchy one, but I'm telling you, the content was far from biblical. Um, what is the role, and specifically, what is the role of the woman in the church? Uh, thankfully, we don't need to purchase, I don't even know if it's in print anymore, but you don't need to go out and purchase bobbed hair, bossy wives, and women preachers for the answer. But we do need to read 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15 to figure out what the answer is regarding the woman's role in the church and how she should conduct herself in wisdom. So let's read the passage together and <clears throat> we have an outline of where we'll be going. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So we're going to be considering the woman's clothing in the church, the woman's character in the church, the woman's conduct in the church, the woman's created order, and the woman's calling. Now, <clears throat> again, we're going, jumping into the middle of an epistle, a book, and if you know anything about 1 Timothy, the purpose of 1 Timothy, Timothy gives, or Paul gives his, his purpose statement in 1 Timothy 3.15 where he says, I'm writing to you so that you will know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, the pillar of the living God. And so he's writing this epistle so they'll know how to conduct themselves in the house of God. And in the beginning of this chapter too, he's Talk to the men of the church, verses 1 to 8, how men are to conduct themselves in the worship service, in the house of God. And now he's turning the corner and he's going to address the woman. What is the woman's role in the church? Well, first of all, he deals with the clothing that she should wear in church as a woman who belongs to the household of God. And so he says this, in like manner, women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, in like manner means in the same way, and it could mean two things, and both are true. It could mean that women in like manner are to pray like the men that he talks about in the previous verses. As they pray, they're to pray without wrath and doubting. They're not to doubt God's goodness. They're not to pray angrily or anything like that. Or it also could mean in like manner, in other words, how she conducts herself in public worship in this same manner than the, she is to conduct herself in this way. And so both are true. And so you can take whichever view uh, you want to because both are accurate and I'm not going to die on that hill. So I will die on some other hills, but not that one. <clears throat> so Paul says that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. The word adorn means to arrange in order. And so it would indicate that our clothing should be arranged in some sort of order. And the word modest means shame or a sense of shame. So it means that as you as a woman, as you come to worship the Lord, there should no, be no shame in what you are wearing. You don't want to cause anyone in church to stumble 
because of the way you are dressed, okay? You want to arrange your clothes in a, a fashion order. In fact, we were at the airport yesterday and I had to take a double take and I I said, Debbie, look at that lady's pants. I mean, one part was lime green and the other part was black. And it was just seemed, everything seemed out of order there. And, uh, you know, you, you should go to the airport sometime if you want to see some strange things. I was just like, whoa, Lord, help me. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, we don't want to come to church and cause anyone to sin because of the way we're dressed. In fact, the word apparel here means a long flowing toga. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go out and, you know, find a store open tonight and go tomorrow, come in with a long flowing toga. Even though uh, somebody confronted me one time, told me I was a false teacher because I didn't teach this, that women should wear long togas for public worship. Uh, but it does mean that a woman should dress for church with the thought in mind she's going to worship the Lord. Have you ever thought when you get dressed on Sunday morning that you're coming to meet the Lord? You ever thought about that? You're coming to meet the Lord. So dress in a way that is pleasing. In fact, Paul goes on to describe the way we should dress. He says, with propriety and moderation. Propriety means to be of sound mind, good sense. Moderation indicates women should not be extreme in their dress. Uh, we should not try and show off our body or the latest fashions by how we are dressing. We don't draw attention to ourselves when we come to church. And indeed, uh, the women in Paul's day did just that. They draw, drew attention to themselves. And he says how? Braided hair, gold, pearls, and cloth, costly clothing. So the first way they overdid their adornment was the braiding of their hair. And you might be saying, I see a lot of you have braids in your hair. My granddaughters have braids. And you might be saying, oh, am I in sin? Am I not supposed to braid my hair? That's not what Paul's saying. You can braid your hair. In fact, Peter says, let it not be merely the braiding of hair, but a meek and quiet spirit when he addresses this same topic. So... It's not saying that. One man helps us here as we can kind of understand. He says, no expense was spared to make clothing dazzling. They actually sparkled. Braids were fastened by jeweled tortoise shell combs, pins, ivory, silver, or the pins were of bronze with jeweled heads. The more varied and expensive, the better. The pin heads often consisted of miniature in images like an animal, a human hand, a female figure. Braids in those days often represented fortunes. They were articles of luxury. The Christian woman is warned not to indulge in such extravagance. In fact, in some churches, they would actually have these hairdos that were, you know, piled high like this. And one man said it looked like a tower of something, you know, because she had so many tears to her head. And braids in Paul's day were uh, the things they would put in the hair. They were expensive and they were gaudy. And Paul is saying, don't come to church to draw attention to yourself. Don't come and worship the Lord and be addressed like that and draw attention to yourself. Now, this doesn't give license either to us as women to come to church with our hair looking like, you know, we just stuck our finger in the electrical socket and, you know, we come looking like a fright. Um, you know, God... God knows the hairs on your head. He's numbered them all. But, uh, you know, have your hair as best as you can with what he's given you to look becoming, but not to draw attention to yourself. The second outlandish adornment was gold and pearls. Again, the same man helps us. He says, similarly, a woman who's a believer must not try to make herself conspicuous by a vain display of ornaments of gold. She shouldn't yearn for pearls from the Persian Gulf or the Indian Ocean. He says, these are often fabulously priced and way beyond the purchasing power of the average church member. In order to obtain a pearl of great value, a merchant might have to sell all of his possessions. In fact, he talks about the wife of an emperor covered with emeralds and pearls gleaming all over her head, her hair, her ears, her neck, and her fingers to the value of over a million dollars. I mean, that is ridiculous, right? That's the end of that quote, aren't you glad? Again, this doesn't mean you can't wear jewelry to church. That's not what Paul's saying. That's not what Peter's saying in 1 Peter. 
But your jewelry should be worn in such a way as to not draw attention to yourself. It should be attractive, be becoming, but you know, as you walk in the back door, that's not the first thing that people see is your jewelry. Lastly, Paul mentions that women should not wear costly clothing. Some women in those days wore dresses that were 7, 000, uh, cost 7,000 denarii, which is 140,000 in American US dollars. Now ladies, if any of you have a dress or any type of clothing, uh, $140,000, you're, you're, that's crazy. I was just telling you, that's crazy. <laughs> I don't even think my whole wardrobe is worth $140,000. <laughs> ladies, when you come to worship the Lord, we don't want to show off our bodies. We don't want to show off our clothes. We don't want to show off our hair, our jewelry. When we dress in the morning for worship, we need to be mindful of dressing to please the Lord, right? Don't dress to attract the attention of men, but dress to show the inner attitude of your heart. I know when my daughter and at that time her fiance, which is now her husband of 15 plus years. I can't even keep track anymore of my kids and how long they've been married, but they were out in California. He was going to seminary and they were in a good sound church and they actually had to quit going. He said, I cannot worship here because the, the girls that would come to church were in short shorts and halter tops, you know, and that was worship. And he said, I can't worship here. It's a stumbling block. Ladies, don't allow your culture to dictate to you as a believer what is appropriate for your dress. Don't worry about what other people think of you. I gave that up a long time ago. I don't care if I'm fashionable or not, and most of the time I'm not. So, uh, in fact, you know, when we moved several years ago and a young man in our church helped us move in our new house and carried my clothes into my closet, he goes, Miss Heck, do you wear all these clothes? And I said, yes, I do, Jermaine. If you keep them long enough, they come back in style. And besides, you know, I'm all sizes at different times, you know. And uh, I don't, you know, doesn't really matter to me. We dress to please the Lord, right? Don't be like that woman in Proverbs 7.10 that Solomon says there was a woman who met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. Ladies, your outer dress reflects your inner heart. Your outer dress reflects your inner heart. By the way, I think we should be conscious of how we dress in other places too. I know we're talking about church, but we need to be careful how we dress. We were out last night with some of these girls here. They took us out and, and I was talking with one of them. We were walking down the, wherever we were, some, some place they took us, Winter Park or something like that. And I looked over at her and I said, you see that girl's t-shirt? It says virginity rocks. And I was like, yeah, that's good. But she wasn't dressed very appropriately. I was like, she's, she's asking for trouble there. So, but we need to be conscious of how we dress everywhere, right? Not just at church. So Paul moves from the clothing women wear to church to the character they should wear to church. And by the way, this is also the character you should wear at all times. To do only this in church is hypocrisy. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are at home is what you are. So if you don't have this character at home, don't try to just do it at church because it's hypocrisy. Notice what he says. He says, but, which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. The but here is a word of contrast. So instead of dressing provocatively, I am to dress properly. Instead of dressing ostentatiously, I'm to dress moderately. Paul puts it like this. We dress in a way that is proper for women who are professing godliness. We are to dress as women who are God-fearing women, right? Right? Women who fear God. Women who are walking in wisdom in the church. In fact, the word professing here means to convey with a message that is loud and clear. <laughs> Women today are dressing with a message that is loud and clear, but it's a far cry from godliness. Right? Do you agree with me? If you don't, just go take a walk or go to the, go to the air, come to the airport with me tomorrow. <laughs> really, sometimes I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of glad for one thing. I mean, I started making a list of all the good things that came out of COVID-19. But uh, one of them is I'm not out that much anymore. And it's kind of good because I don't have to see all this. But sometimes I would dread to go out to places 
just because of this one thing, seeing how women dress, knowing that there will be women who are not appropriately dressed. I feel for the men in our age. Uh, I, my grandsons, I, you know, I have five grandsons and they're all teenagers now, most of them, one's almost there. And I fear for them because they have to deal with many women who are inappropriately dressed and are flaunting their bodies and dressing seductively. Now, having said that, I will also say that a godly woman should look nice at church, but she doesn't, again, have to have the latest fashions in order to do that. You don't have to shop all week spending money on jewelry and the latest trend that so you can shock everyone at Sunday, you know, with your new outfit. Ladies, realize, do you know those clothes you're wearing going to burn up one day? You know what Peter says? Everything in this world is going to burn up, right? Ladies, your heart should not be set on your outward appearance, but on your inner Right? Your inner attitude of a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. In fact, Paul puts it like this. Notice what he says. As women who profess godliness with good works. Notice very carefully what he says. Not good looks. Did he say that? Good works. Not good looks. Good works. Ladies, it should be our good works that is our adornment. That should attract the attention of those we worship with. Not our clothes. When they see you coming in the door on Sunday morning, oh, there goes so-and-so. Look at her great clothes. No, here comes so-and-so. You know, she's a servant of the Lord. You know, she serves the Lord all week. She comes here. She's got ministry here at the church. She's full of good works. They don't, they don't want to be looking at your jewelry, your makeup, your hair. That's not what should attract the attention. It's your good works. Remember Dorcas when she died in Luke chapter 9 and Peter goes and the women are weeping and crying and, you know, showing all of her what? All the things that she made. And it says this woman was known for what? Her good works. Dorcas was known for that. Ladies, a woman of God will focus on her good works. That's what she spends her time on. One man says this, it reflects a right attitude of mind, for Paul was shrewd enough to know that a woman's dress is a mirror of her mind. A woman's dress is the mirror of her mind. A woman's adornment, in short, lies not in what she herself puts on, but in the loving service she gives out. End of quote. Ladies, as Peter says in his epistle, do not let your adornment be merely the outward adorning of braiding the hair and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. That's what we need to focus on. Well, Paul now moves from her character to her conduct in church in verse 11 and 12. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Now, Paul also addresses this when he writes the church in Corinth, which was a man of mess. He writes in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, let the women keep silent in the church for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Now, before you get upset and throw your candy at me, which you can throw the Reese's at me, that'll be just fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll take all of your Reese's. But before you get upset, we need to study what this means, right? Okay? What does this mean? We need to understand New Testament times. Their church services were a lot different than ours. If you read 1 Corinthians, they were standing up while the speaker was speaking. One would stand up and do this. One would stand up and do that. That's why at the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, let everything be done decently and in order. Why? Because the church service was, you know, kind of chaotic at times. And so they would dialogue with each other. They would challenge the, the speaker or whoever was preaching. And we also need to understand something else as we think about this. In the biblical world, it was unheard of for a woman to come to church. They were discouraged from learning. They were to remain at home. Did you know women in the biblical world were never allowed to appear alone in public? I mean, it was a very restricted life they led. And so those that call Paul a male chauvinist have no idea, or at least they haven't studied biblical history, to know what was going on in the church at this time. So listen, ladies, Paul is actually commending us as women to learn 
in the church service. There's no male or female, right? We're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, with that in mind, there are roles for us, roles for men, roles for women that we must adhere to. So Paul says, let a woman learn in silence. Now learn here means to listen, be taught. What does silence mean? Does it mean she's muzzled? No. The word silence actually means to remain calm. Remain calm. Women should come to church to listen, to listen. And as they do that, they remain calm. She's to do it with all submission and the utmost respect to those that are in authority over her. She should not be rebellious in her heart, in her actions that are calling in life as a woman. She shouldn't be rebellious towards that. Now, can a woman teach ladies? Can she teach children? Can women talk to people? We had somebody recently that, you know, said, well, I don't even think we should talk in, you know, the lobby or the parking lot. And I said, well, where do you draw the line here, you know? <laughs> you can't talk at all? Of course you can. Women can teach women. Women, you know, what does Titus 2 say? The older women teach the young women, right? I don't know how, then you te can teach. You can teach children. Uh, you can talk to people at church. You can sing. You can, there's a lot of things you can do in the public assembly. However, ladies, our limitations have to do with men, as explained in this next verse. I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. One of the questions I'm often asked when I go speak at women's conferences or retreats is this, what is the woman's role in the church? Why can't a woman be a pastor? And uh, I've often received a lot of angry uh, looks for my answers, but I've even actually had places I've been where I've said, I'm not speaking until these men leave. And I have made <clears throat> men upset with me, but uh, I usually end up saying something like, this is what the scripture teaches. Uh, I don't know what they think when it says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. My Bible doesn't say, if a woman desires the office of a pastor, she desires a good thing, right? It says, if a man. So I don't know what the problem is, but I usually end up saying, these are my spiritual convictions. I usually take them to this, pa this passage and the other one I just quoted. And then I also, if that doesn't suffice them, I say, well, I'm under the submission and the authority of my husband who says, I can't do this, and my elders, right? And I am to be submissive unto them. And so sometimes that silences them, sometimes it doesn't. Now, Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach a man. So I'm not sure what the opponent's issues are with this verse. This is a command. It's not an option. Remember, Paul is writing so that we can know how to behave ourselves in the house of God, right? Right? which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Uh, so he's writing on how we behave in the local assembly, how we conduct ourselves. We're not to have authority over the man in the church. In fact, the words have authority means to play the master. We're not to be the master. We're not to interrupt the preacher by the next words he says. We're to be in silence. Remember, they were standing up and spouting off things. So what Paul is saying here, as you sit and listen to your pastor on Sunday, you're to be calm, you're to listen, and you don't stand up and challenge him. We actually, in our church, had a woman that did this several years ago. She's uh, passed away this last year. I think she went to a Christless eternity, but uh, she actually did this in our worship service. She would always challenge my husband, or didn't, it didn't only happen once, actually, uh, well, maybe twice. I don't know if it happened once or twice. I can't remember a couple times, but uh, she was church discipline, put out of the church, not only for that, spouting off and trying to challenge my husband as he was preaching, but she was also using legal and illegal drugs, oh, abusing those. But that's the idea. We are to listen, and we're not to challenge the preacher as he's preaching. We're to be in silence. We're to listen with all respect. And again, remember the history of what was going on. In fact, my husband has told me recently, 
because on every, um, pretty often about once a month, we'll have a Q&A on Sunday night where he opens it up to men and women who can ask theological questions or counseling questions or any kind of question they want, which he loves to do and the people love it. But he says, you know, I'm kind of thinking maybe with at least the women, because some of them will then kind of try to challenge him. And he says, I really think it's a violation of this passage because it'd be wiser to talk to him privately afterwards instead of in a public assembly. No, no harm in them asking questions of him publicly, but not to try to challenge because it would be a violation of this passage. So the question might come to your mind, can a man learn from a woman? Of course he can. Do you know in all the passages where Priscilla is mentioned, there's six of them in the Word of God, do you know four out of those six passages she's mentioned first? And in, especially in one, in Acts chapter 18, remember when pa Apollos was in error about, the, about baptism? And it says, Priscilla and Aquila, her husband, took him aside and explained to him the way of God more excellently. And the Greek order there is that Priscilla did most of the talking. Um, many believe that Priscilla was actually a stronger believer than her husband and knew more. And so it's very interesting that she's mentioned in the Greek when somebody's name is mentioned first, they're more prominent. And so she's mentioned uh, first four times out of the six times. Men can learn from women. Men can learn from women. But women are not to teach in the public assembly of worship. Uh, in fact, this is the second time the word silence is mentioned, so it must be important. And again, it doesn't mean you're muzzled. It doesn't mean you have to wear your mask and not talk. <laughs> uh, it does mean you need to be peaceable. You need to be quiet. You need to be calm and not challenge the preacher in the pulpit. Now, you might say, well, Susan, Paul is a male chauvinist, and he's really making me angry. I don't like this passage. Well, he's not a male chauvinist. I'm sorry he makes you angry. But remember, he's writing by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? These are God-breathed words, ladies. God breathed this out. But he gives a reason why. Why in verse 13? Why do we behave this way in the church of God? And it has to do with our created order. Notice what he says, for this is the reason. This is the reason why women do this in the church. Why? Because Adam was first formed, then Eve. Ladies, the first reason women are to be silent in the church is because Adam was created first, not Eve. Eve was not created first. He was. This was the order of creation. The head of the home was created first. And if this isn't enough, Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. In fact, later on he says, For man is not from woman, but woman from the man. Nor was the man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. Ladies, man, woman was taken out of man's side, right? Not to be his Holy Spirit, not to be his mother, to be his helper, right? Right? To be his helper. Well, Paul gives a second reason why women should not teach men in the local assembly besides of the created order. Look what he says in verse 14. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. She fell into transgression. Ladies, the second reason she's not to usurp authority over a man in the local assembly is because of her, because she was deceived in the garden. In fact, women are more easily deceived. The word deceived means here completely deceived. She was seduced wholly. Look at, look at Gen turn back to Genesis 3. I'm already getting looks from some of you, so I won't see you tomorrow, but I'll, that's all right. I wonder why this is so hard for us. Genesis 3. I don't know about you. I'm glad God made me a woman, so... Wait till we get to tomorrow and we'll talk about husbands loving their wives. You think you got it bad? <laughs> Love the wife the way Christ loved the church? That's a challenge, isn't it? Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, oh, we can eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it nor touch it, lest you die. 
And the serpent said to the woman, you won't die. For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So the woman, when she saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it and she ate it. She gave it to her husband with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Ladies, Adam disobeyed willfully. The woman was deceived by the serpent. In fact, Paul says in another place, 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, I fear somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds are corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes about false teachers who come into women's homes, silly women laden away with lust who are led astray by false teachers. Why do they prey on women? Because we are more easily deceived than men. That's why for 40 years now, or 30, or how long ever I've been teaching, I have been saying the same thing to women. Get into the Bible. Get into the Word of God. Know what God says. Why? We are more easily deceived. We need to know the Scriptures, right? You need to know the Word of God. You need to be discerning. Ladies, what Adam did, he did on his own with a willful choice. He knew what he was doing. Eve was deceived, and she fell into transgression. Ladies, as a woman, recognize your weakness. You know, I, I'm a very strong woman. I really am. I'm, I'm very, in fact, you know, I, my husband will say, strong as an ox, dumb as a bull. Not really. He used to say that when I was pregnant. <laughs> And I'm a very strong woman. I understand that. I, I'm independent. I'm strong. I mean, I'm under the submission of my husband and see that as freeing and a blessing. But even in that, we should recognize our weaknesses. I'm so thankful for the many, many times that my husband has helped me in an area where I could see where I could be more easily led astray or deceived. Men are just built different and wired differently than we are. And Satan knew she would be easier. Eve would be easier to tempt than Adam. And so he tempted her. And she fell into sin. Remember Peter says we're the weaker vessel. <laughs> Ladies, women should realize Eve was the one who was deceived. And because of that, she should take a humble attitude. Now, maybe all this sounds pretty bleak to you. But it's not. It's really not. Paul leaves us with a wonderful outlook in verse 15 as he gives us the woman's calling. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. I will say this is one of the most difficult verses in this epistle to interpret. There's some really weird interpretations out there, about as weird as those spirits in prison that are in chapter 3. But um, it's really not when you look at it. Look at it carefully. Paul says she will be saved through childbearing. Now, ladies, we know this is not salvific because women are not saved by bearing children, right? We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone, right? We are not saved by giving birth to a child. And so we know that's not what it means. But the Greek word salvation can mean several things in Scripture. And here it means to be delivered. It's not salvific in the sense of salvation. To be delivered or to be set free. Ladies, in other words, listen very carefully. Women can be delivered from the stigma of Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden by being set free through delivering children and raising them to the glory of God. John MacArthur says this, the pain associated with childbirth was the punishment for the woman's sin, but her joy and privilege of child rearing delivers women from the stigma of that sin. In fact, Paul writes later on in this epistle, I will that the, therefore the young women marry, bear children, rule the household. Why? So she gives no occasion for Satan to be, be spoken of reproachfully. Ladies, a Christian woman's role is not to be a female pastor, but to be a female parent by raising children to the glory of God. 
And I hope you see your role as that. I am so thankful. God only gave us two children, but I'm so thankful that I was able to raise my children for the glory of God. Both of them are in, uh, both of their spouses and them are in, the, in full-time ministry and raising my seven grandchildren in the nurture and admonition of Christ. However, we must, just like a man, we must continue, as Paul says, in faith and holiness and self-control. We must continue in that. In fact, it's interesting, this triad is what Paul began this epistle with in 1 Timothy in chapter 1, verse 5. He says, the purpose of commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and faith unfeigned. So what does this mean when he says she must continue in these things? Well, faith would be her faith in the Lord. Love would be her love to everyone, and holiness would be just that she is set apart. And she does this with all self-control, which means to be sober-minded. Ladies, this is a high calling. In fact, Paul reiterates this in Titus 2, where he mentions old women teach young women. And the first thing that, that I am to teach you as an older woman is to be self-controlled. <laughs> to be self-controlled. So, what is the woman's clothing in the church? From verse 9. Women are to dress in modest clothing and jewelry that is becoming the profession of her faith in Christ. What about you? What about the way you come to dress to worship? Do you stop at look at yourself in the mirror and ask if what you are wearing pleases the Lord? Would you dress in that manner if Christ was going to visit your church this Sunday? He is. He's going to be there. He's here right now, right? Since he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, right? Are you secretly drawing attention to yourself by the way you dress? Do you purposely dress seductively in tight fit clothes and low blouses to attract the attention of men? Are you wearing clothes in a way that a man would desire something in you that you cannot righteously fulfill? Ladies, for those of you that are married, you might ask your husband before you leave the house, yeah, honey, am I dressed appropriately? And for those of you with daughters, please make sure they're dressed appropriately. Before my daughter became a believer, uh, we went round and round and we'd go clothes shopping. I'm like, you're not buying that. No, you're not buying that. And you're not buying that either. And uh, so, you know, uh, Martha Peace has a great book out called uh, Clothes. It's more than just modesty. So you might pick that up and go through that with your teenage daughters. The woman's character in the church from verse 10, women are not to focus on their good looks, but their good works. How much time have you spent this past week focusing on your inner heart? How much time have you spent in the Word, in prayer, and with God's people this last week in comparison to the time you've spent on Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and I can't even name all the other, Google, and, you know, there's new ones every day coming up. How much time is spent on your inner woman versus the outer woman? What good works have you done for the Master this week? And the woman's conduct in the church from verses 11 and 12. Women are to learn with all calmness and submission to those in authority over her. Are you guilty of overstepping your boundaries? Do you secretly wish that you could be the preacher in the pulpit? The woman's created order from verses 13 to 14. Have you embraced the God-given truth that the woman was created second for the purpose of being a helper to her husband? Do you dwell on the untruth that you are a second-class Christian? Do you joy in the fact that God has created you to be a woman? And what is the woman's calling from verse 15? We are called to be delivered from the stigma of Eve's sin by rearing children to the glory of God and by continuing in faith, love, and holiness. And we do all this with a serious mindset. Do you take your parenting seriously and are you rearing your children in the nurture and admonition of Christ? Does your life exhibit faith, love, holiness? Would others say you have a sense about you that you are sober-minded and calm in your spirit? Well, instead of being known as women with bobbed hair who are bossy wives and women preachers, how about we be known as women who properly dress, perform godly, and produce children? 
My friend, this describes a woman who is walking in wisdom in the church. Let's pray. Lord, Father, God, we thank you again that you have called us to be women. We thank you that you have placed those in authority over us who are godly men who teach us and train us, who have nurtured us through the years. We do thank you that we as women can encourage and teach one another and help one another. We thank you for the children that you allow us to raise for your glory. We thank you, Father, that uh, we live in a culture where we can come to church and learn. I thank you that Christ comes in and changes the culture that we live in, and I thank you for that. I thank you for the good churches that are represented here, Father, where women can go and learn. And I thank you for women who teach other women the Bible. So, Father, we pray that this would not discourage us, but encourage us in the things and the ways that you have called us to uh, perform as women. I pray also, Lord, for this evening that as we go back to our perspective homes and places that we would reflect on these two messages, walking in wisdom in the world and in the church, and prepare our hearts tomorrow, Lord, as we think about how we can walk in wisdom in our home and in, our, in those that are single, and then, Lord, in our calling as we think about what type of wisdom we need to possess. So give us rest, I pray. Bring us back tomorrow refreshed and ready for another day, Lord, of learning and growing and fellowshipping with one another. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.